Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program, and our first person today is Mrs. Estelle Laughlin, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their support. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as volunteers here at this museum. Our program will continue twice weekly through mid-August. The museum's website at www.ushmm.org provides information about each of our upcoming first person guests. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that you'll find in your program or speak with the museum representative after our program today. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Estelle Laughlin's biography so that you can remember and share her testimony after she leaves here today, after you leave here today. Estelle will share with us her first person account of her experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes or so. If we have time toward the end of our program, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask Estelle a few questions. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Estelle is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief present slide presentation to help with her introduction. Estelle Laughlin was born in Warsaw, Poland on July 9, 1929. Poland is highlighted on this map of Europe in 1933. And Warsaw is highlighted on this map of Poland also in 1933. Estelle was the younger of two sisters. In addition to her parents, her family included many aunts, uncles, and cousins. The Nazis invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. Soon after the invasion, Estelle and her family were forced to move into the Warsaw Ghetto. This photo was taken when Estelle came to the United States after the war. In 1943, the family went into hiding in a bunker in the ghetto. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began on April 19, 1943, and continued until the final liquidation of the ghetto on May 16, 1943. Jewish fighters faced overwhelmingly superior forces of the Germans, but were able to hold them off for a month. Estelle and her family were hiding in a bunker during the uprising, and were among those who were discovered and forced out of hiding. We see here an historical photograph of German soldiers leading Jews captured during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to the assembly point for deportation in May 1943. After they were discovered, Estelle and her family were deported to the Majdanek extermination camp where Estelle's father was killed. The location of Majdanek is highlighted on this map of extermination camps in Poland. Estelle, her mother and sister, endured labor in two more camps before eventually being liberated by the Russians. Estelle, her mother and sister, emigrated to the United States in 1947 on the Marine Flasher. We close with Estelle's immigration certificate, which was issued in July 1947. When Estelle, her sister, and her mother arrived in New York in 1947, they had $30 between them. Estelle and her sister went to work in the garment district. She met her husband, who was a survivor from Berlin in New York. After marrying, they moved to Cleveland, where her husband was a labor organizer. After the birth of her first son, Estelle began attending college in Cleveland and finished after they moved to the Washington, D.C. area in 1961, when her husband joined the Kennedy administration. They have three sons. Estelle became a teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland, earned a master's degree, and became a reading specialist. She retired in 1992. Estelle's three sons are very accomplished. One is a professor of geology, another is a psychologist, and the third has his own business. Between them, they have given Estelle seven grandchildren, one for each day of the week, as she notes. Estelle's husband died in 2008. She moved five years ago from the Washington, D.C. area to Chicago to be close to family. 
Estelle volunteers the museum's Speakers Bureau. Until her 2011 move to Chicago, she was also a member of the Survivors Writing Group and a contributor to the museum's publication, Echoes of Memory. She has written a book about her and her family's experience during the Holocaust entitled Transcending Darkness, A Girl's Journey Out of the Holocaust. It was a finalist for the 2012 Forward Review's Book of the Year Award. She is now writing a work of fiction for young adults about the Warsaw Ghetto with a working title of Stateless. Following our program today, Estelle will sign copies of Transcending Darkness. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mrs. Estelle Laughlin. Estelle, thank you so much for joining us and for your willingness to be our first person today. We have just a short hour and you have so much to share with, you, so, uh, with us, so we'll start right away. You were just 10 living in Warsaw when World War II began with Germany's invasion of Pol Poland in September 1939. Before we turn to what would happen to you and your family during the war and the Holocaust, Start first with telling us a little bit about your family, your community, your life in Warsaw before war began. I was born in Warsaw, Poland, to a middle-class family. Warsaw was the center of my universe and glows in my selective memory in golden radiance of lilac trees against open blue skies rich sounds of good neighbors, kindness and trust and love. Uh, magic train rides to the country with family uh, became shelters in my memory. As a matter of fact, when I lost everything, these memories became my possessions. Estelle, you said to me, um, when I think of that time, I think of loving neighbors, trains to the countryside, time with family and friends. Everything was bright and wonderful. Yes. That's, that was your life in those days, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Tell, yes. Tell us a little bit about your father. From what I've read about him in your book and what you've told me, he was a remarkable man. My father was my pillar. Um, he was a wonderful man. Um, he taught me the values that helped me survive with a lot of suffering, with love and compassion and love for humanity and joy for life. Life should be lived joyfully. And your mother, she had fled from violence and anti-Semitism in Russia. Just say a little bit about her, too. Well, uh, Unfortunately, the Jewish history is very complicated. While the Holocaust is the most horrendous, and I don't need to compare, but um, there were inquisitions and there were periodic uh, persecutions of Jews. Mm -hmm. And my mother was born in, uh, in a shtetl in, uh, in a, a, a be Belarus and Russia, and she was chased out by the Cossacks, and then she came um, to uh, Poland, to Warsaw, uh, married a man that she was very much in love with, uh, was very proud of her two children, and then uh, the second war, this, uh, um, she was persecuted again, and I hope never, ever again. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, beginning World War II. They attacked Warsaw that very day. What, what do you re remember of that day and then of the siege of Warsaw? Immediately, my life changed beyond recognition. I, uh, actually, it started out uh, September 1st. It was a serene day, and suddenly we heard this tremendous explosion and then such silence as though all the air was sucked out of the universe, and then the screeching of sirens, and then we heard on the radio 
that Poland was attacked, um, that uh, bombs were dropped on Warsaw without declaring war. And in this one moment, I stopped being a carefree child and took on the burdens, the heavy burdens of suffering and, mm -hmm. and war. Warsaw <clears throat> held out for a month following the German invasion of Poland. You wrote that the German army marched into Warsaw on October 1st, 1939, and that immediately my life changed beyond imagination. Tell us about those changes once the Germans occupied Warsaw. My peaceful streets were then patrolled by foreign soldiers. They snapped whips in our homes and our streets. They cut off electricity. They rationed all food. They made book, uh, books uh, illegal. They closed schools. Um, uh, they then very soon isolated us in a small ghetto and they built a thick wall around us and they filled the ghetto with uh, droves of uh, Jewish people driven out from surrounding areas. There was not enough food, there was not enough clothing People were dying of starvation and cold and, uh, and illness. They covered the bodies of children with posters saying, our um, children are the holiest things. Our children must live. Mm -hmm. And yet, in this inferno, People gathered all the courage that was really in us and fought so heroically uh, back morally. That was a moral, originally there was a moral resistance. Um, immediately the Jewish community in the ghetto organized itself in a self-aid um, center. Uh, everybody who had a little bit more than their neighbors helped. Um, there was not a child in our building. Warsaw was an ancient city, and most people lived in apartment buildings. There was not a child in our building over the age of 10 who did not in some way contribute, either help. The, every building had a kitchen for the starving neighbors. So we would stir the, the pots to help in the kitchen or peel potatoes, or we would collect uh, clothing. We put on fabulous shows uh, for neighbors and collected money for the more needy ones. Still, when, when you were forced to move into the ghetto along with um, several hundred thousand other Jews in a compact yes. area, and a wall was built around the ghetto. Yes. Just describe a little bit about that and, and what, what it looked like. Well, there were 400,000 people living in an area approximately 1.3 miles. So the congestion was enormous. Uh, in, some, in some buildings, 11, 12, 15, sometimes even more, people lived in one room. Uh, there was squalor, there was poverty, there was children with, with bare feet and, and bare knees begging, uh, many without, uh, many orphans. Uh, the squalor was terrible. Um, you know, I said that it, it, I, it's very important for me to share the, the heroism uh, of the people in the ghetto. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why didn't you fight back? Why didn't the people in the ghetto fight back? But they did fight back so, so very, very bravely. To own a book was an act of defiance, capital punishment, punishable by death. Yet all over the ghetto there were uh, the secret libraries. My father had a secret stash of books 
by Yiddish writers, by Sholem Aleichem and Sholem Ash and Isaac Peretz, nights, windows blinded with covers to keep our existence secret in a small room illuminated by a flickering carbide lantern. My father would pull out his books and read to us. Our room felt like a capsule of paradise separating us from the silence, uh, curfew silence outside our windows. You know, uh, all over the ghetto, schools were forbidden, yet all over the ghetto, um, excuse me, there were um, a brave unemployed teacher who risked their lives and met with children in small rooms and taught them to hold on to their imagination and faith in love. We even had theaters. Imagine theaters when there was no bread. There was a very wonderful and remarkable historian in the ghetto. His name was Chaim Kaplan. And he said that it is that it is astounding that at a time when we don't seem to need it at all, we need poetry more than we need bread. And it is true. The soul needs to be nourished uh, as much as the body does. That I think our ability, our creative ability, our ability to think for ourselves, is our godliness, and this was our way of holding on to our culture, to our godliness, to our humanity. Um, so these were some of the examples of uh, of uh, of the of the squalor, of the of the persecution, of the indignities, and the dignity and the ways that we uh, held on to our dignity. And I feel that this is reflective of all of us, that goodness and, 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 and love for beauty and love for humanity is, is part of us. Estelle, you wrote in your book that children followed adult examples to resist barbaric laws. In our apartment complex, there was no child over 10 who did not have some public duty. Just say a bit about right. that. Right. Uh, in my book, I describe how, uh, how we put on the secret uh, uh, place. Um, and you know, we children um, had to hide our books under clo our clothes to go to our secret uh, classes. Well, that took a lot of courage. As a child, I don't think that I ever stopped and, and, and gave myself credit for the courage it took. But now I see that it did take such courage. And children are very wise in the process of writing my book seeing the child that I was through the eyes of an old woman that I am now, I saw the wisdom of children. I saw how, um, how, um, how children know right from wrong and how they make choices and good choices. And for the children in the audience here, I feel self-conscious about um, sharing some of the cruelties that I will be sharing, but I want to reassure you that if you hold on to that which is best in you, you'll always be all right. Still, the, the Nazis started deporting large numbers of Jews out of Warsaw to death and concentration camps in 1942. For a substantial period of time, your family was able to avoid being deported. How did your parents manage to keep you from being taken by the Nazis? How were you able to survive during that time? Uh, in July of 1942, the month of my 13th birthday, things became even more gruesome. This was the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
we didn't have the faintest idea that the deportation meant death. So, uh, and, uh, some Jewish people were forced to write false letters to families, inviting them to Bialystok and Minsk, different towns, where they were sheltered and fed and, uh, and, and, and um, clothed. So you can imagine that the famished people, the homeless people, that many people marched unwillingly, I mean unknowingly and willingly, to, uh, to Umschlagplatz, which was a deportation uh, um, 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 station, and loaded onto freight trains and, uh, re and, and, and disappeared from our existence. We, my family, uh, uh, not everyone marched. Most people, or many people, I don't know if most, but many people hid. Now, where does one hide in an apartment building? Pretty much where I played with my grandchildren and hide and go seek between, uh, uh, behind couches, behind chairs, uh, under beds. Uh, we hid between mattresses and box springs. Any corner we could find, hoping that we would not be uh, found. My family hid in a room that they obscured the door with a wardrobe. So while we were uh, in, in, in our hiding, uh, people were marched out of our lives. We never heard from the people who were taken away from us. But some people somehow managed either to hide under corpses or in some way I, I, I avoided at that point uh, being, uh, being destroyed. And they came back to the ghetto and they told us about these horrendous train rides to a place called Treblinka where <coughs> our people were guests. Still, it's, at some point the Nazis decreed that all children under the age of 14 were useless to them. Um, you were four, 13 at the time. Right. What, what did that mean mean for you? Well, um, children under third, under 14 were contraband, and I was 13. I was petrified that I will be. My biggest fear was to be separated from my family. Um, death uh, was very un strange to me, I couldn't quite understand it. But I had one important uh, wish, was that if I make my transition to death, that I hold on to the hands of my parents. Uh, and so I was very frightened of being uh, 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 separated from them. I had braids, so my mother cut my braids and froofed my hair up and dressed me in more uh, adult clothes. Just to make you look older. Um, just to make me look older. Mm -hmm. And I asked my father, I said to him, what will you do if they come and get me? And he said, I'll burn their eyes out with acid. I believed him that I was um, loved, that I was safe, if only in his love. By November of 1942, three quarters of Warsaw's Jews had been deported and killed. And you and your sister Fredka were two of the one percent of children yeah. that were left in the Warsaw right. ghetto. I mean, almost devoid of children. Right. I was, yeah, we were among the 1% of children. Can you imagine a world without the sound of children, without the presence of grandmothers and grandfathers, because children and old people were the first ones to be deported? There was such silence, there was such such dread. There was such emptiness. I remember when I would walk up to the window or walk up to the gate of our building and stick my head out hoping that I would hear a sound of life. And 
the only silence crawled to me. It was so palpable. Amazing what human beings can endure and remain human, which is really one of the reasons why I share my story. And I'm sure this is one of the reasons why you are all here, to be reminded that human beings are capable of great evil. And in recognizing that, recognize the importance of love and harmony and dignity of every individual. At the start of 1943, you went to work in a factory, uh, a German factory. Tell us about that. Well, before that, we were in, so uh, before that, that, oh, oh, right. Um, uh, all the Jewish people who, there was only a, hand, a handful of uh, people who remained uh, towards the end um, of the liquidation of the ghetto. A very, a few thousand Jewish people uh, out of the 400,000 uh, were still alive. Only the people who were useful to the Nazis uh, had a right to exist. They were like, 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 they, like demigods. They decided who was to live and who was, uh, who was not to live. So um, there was just a small group of people who were permitted to live, provided they were not old, provided they were not children, and provided that they were useful, therefore, uh, uh, to prove their usefulness if they could find employment uh, in three factories, three German factories that were stationed in that small sub-ghetto. So everyone to work for, uh, to, to get permission to work in that factory uh, was, was, um, was a license to live. And, and, in, and in truth, you were a little girl now working as right, an actor. Right, right, right. But having to pretend that you were older. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you would continue doing that for not too terribly long because you were there during the remarkable Warsaw Uprising and, the, and then the subsequent horrific obliteration of the ghetto. Right. Tell us what happened during the uprising and with you and your family particularly. So I shared with you that people, some people managed to come to the ghetto and tell us about the horrific train rides and about Treblinka. Mm -hmm. When uh, uh, the uh, remainder of the Jewish people, the small group of people, uh, became aware of Treblinka, they began to organize themselves into armed resistance. My father was a member of the armed resistance too. Uh, they started to build bunkers in the basements, bunkers, a, a network of bunkers, and, and they dug tunnels so that they could navigate between the bunkers, and also a tunnel to, um, uh, under the wall to be able to get to the Christian side and get from the Poles, um, uh, Polish um, underground some um, ammunition uh, to fight with. Uh, unfortunately, not all the ammunition was delivered and not all the instructions were delivered either. So you can imagine these were uh, uh, warriors who uh, uh, were so needy of the instructions and they didn't quite get it. So, um, uh, so we, we had that bunker and um, uh, events erupted with uh, German columns entering uh, the, the, the small ghetto. They entered with, uh, with, uh, with tanks and armored cars and flocks of planes. And uh, there was a, a, a big announcement, humongous loudspeakers saying that everyone better report for resettlement. Of course, we knew what resettlement meant or they'll destroy everyone. 
and uh, when we heard that we had a bunker. Our, we used to live on the second floor, but we moved to the uh, 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 ground floor. Our a five-story building with four uh, blocks, uh, we were the only family, so there was no issue. It was easy to find the uh, apartment and, uh, on the uh, ground floor. And when we heard this, that we better report immediately, we had a, a, a bunker and a secret trap door. The uh, powder room floor and the commode lifted, and we pulled the trap door down the world, I, and we, I stepped down into the damp, dank underworld, which was to be my, my world for who knows how long. The, the, the ceiling pressed down on me, the damp walls closed in on me. The flickering of the carbide light was the substitute for the sun. The clicking of the clock was our only clue when morning was rising and when sun was setting. The few people who were in the bunker with me were my whole nation. Um, how I longed for, for the open horizon, for the blue crispness of day. While we were in the bunker, should I proceed? Mm -hmm. While we were in the bunker, uh, the, uh, uh, the fighters, fighting broke out in the street, facing a 20th century army, armed from head to toe, facing armored cars, facing flux, the, the, the sky was black with, with airplanes, bomb, bombs dropping all around us, was a small band of freedom fighters, poorly clad, poorly fled, poorly armed. They climbed up on rooftops. They stepped in front of windows, opened the windows. They dashed out. The sewers were also a very essential way of, uh, of uh, communication without being seen. And they dashed out from the, from, the, from the tunnels, from the sewers, and they lobbed Molotov cocktails and hand grenades and whatever ammunition they had. You know, it is really noteworthy that it took this handful, this band of, of fighters longer to fight than it took from po for Poland and France to capitulate. For one full month they held out. For, right. How were you discovered? And at some point a grenade was thrown into our bunker. We had no corner to hide anymore and they dragged us out in the streets. We did not march like a swarm of of nameless people. We were people with names, with love. Sometimes children ask me, how did you feel? And I tell them, I felt just like you feel inside. They ask me, how do you feel? did you feel inside? And I tell them, I, feel just, I felt just like they feel inside. I too wanted to uh, catch a ball soaring in the air. I too wanted to feel grass under my, my bare feet. I too wanted to take my family, my parents and my friends for granted. The only difference, the big difference was that I couldn't do it and the children then couldn't do it. And, uh, and my grandchildren and the children today can do it, and that's the way it should be. And so they dragged us through, uh, through uh, uh, the burning ghetto. Uh, flames, enormous tongues of flames were licking the sky and painting it in otherworldly colors of iridescence 
plumes of gas, of, uh, of smoke, uh, our mouth, our lips were chapped, we were, and, and, and they marched us to Umschlagplatz and uh, loaded us onto freight trains. In the morning we woke up, we uh, arrived uh, in Maidanek, an extermination camp. And I know that there, there aren't the words to describe it adequately here, but tell us about Maidanek, uh, which you went to with your parents and your sister, and you would lose your father there. Uh, my Maidanek was was uh, sur surrounded by an electrified barbed wire fence. There were columns, uh, a, 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 um, towers, where the guards watched us every step we went with, with beams of light. In the center of the camp was a gallow with, from which, from the gibbets, our, uh, our friends were uh, dangling. I don't know why they needed to scare us more uh, and punish us so much more. Um, there was, uh, uh, within sight, there was uh, uh, the guest chamber with the, with the chimney. Uh, and, um, uh, and our work, it was completely useless. We dug up turf from one place and, and replaced it and planted it in another place. Um, you know, even in Maidanek, in this, in this indescribable inferno, we still composed songs uh, and, and, and poetry. Uh, of course, women, there were no children and there were no old people and men were uh, separated, uh, the few. Actually, all, uh, we knew that our existence there was only for one purpose. We were waylaid, we were, we were uh, 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 waiting uh, uh, to be, to be a guest. And uh, which leads probably to the next question, if I may jump. Please. Is how, how we, how we. First, when, when, did you, when did you know, when did you last see your father? Um, the last time I saw my father was when we were separated. My father was sitting with a group of men, and we were, I was sitting with a group of women, and the children, there were just a few children that we kept in the hiding, in the ghetto, not to be seen, and they were uh, dragged out, and they were in this little place that looked like a, like a stable. Um, my father was sitting uh, with the men, and he was sitting in front. He was very sick. He um, had to be, his, his blood was crimson. Um, um, he sat in front of the row, and he looked so sad. I was so used to looking into my father's eyes for reassurance, for, for steadiness, for love, and there, there he was, looking so miserable. Uh, so uh, when the guards walked past us, I dashed in front of him, and I kneeled down. And I said, Tata, don't worry, they won't get me. I turned the lapel of my coat. We had cyanide sewn into our lapels. I said, Tata, they'll never get me. Remember, I have cyanide. My father looked up to me and he said, no, darling, you must live. You, and you, I you had a photograph of your father that you lost. Mm -hmm. Tell us how it was taken from you. Uh, when uh, we arrived in uh, Maidanek, um, we, by then I was already separated from uh, my father. Uh, that was with my mother and sister. My sister was a year and a half old. There was also 14 years old. And um, we were marched, sure that we were marched to the showers. And we knew what the showers meant. 
Now, there was, I still had my clothes on, and I had one treasure that I hid under the lining of my shoe. That was my father's photograph. A German soldier stopped me, and he said, what do you have hidden? Uh, he probably won't hope that maybe I have some gold or some jewelry hidden. And I assured him, I said, I have absolutely nothing. He said, yes, you do. So I quickly was thinking that the photograph, if he, if he, if he finds me, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to lie. <laughs> and so I thought, if I'll show him the photograph, it's so useless to him. I said, I have one thing hidden. And I pulled out the photograph, and I said, this is my father. Can I have it? And he snatched it away. And that was the last possession that I had that was, yeah. Estelle, now it's you, your sister, and your mother. And in the time we have left, you would be at Maidanic for a while, then move to several other camps. I know it's very hard to compress it, but tell us, what happened to the three of you from there? I'm going to have to abbreviate it very much, okay. Um, my, my mother and sister and I had a pact that if one of us would be sent to the guest chamber, all three of us would go. My mother, by the way, was the only mother, only mother in the entire camp. All the other mothers were killed to the best of my knowledge. We were the only family of three, to the best of my knowledge, that uh, lived in that camp. So everyone else practically was alone. And so we considered ourselves to be very fortunate. My sister was beaten very, very severely. And the following day when we were uh, to report for work, she was not able to stand up, and I describe in my book uh, the circumstances. Um, so we hid her in, under the banks. When my mother and I came back from work, my sister ran up to us and she said, thank God, um, um, everything, this is the end. My sister felt, she, she felt so indignant about the humil humiliating um, conditions of our, uh, our existence. For instance, we didn't even have bathrooms in Maidanek. There was one ditch at the uh, edge of the, of the barbed wires that was an open pit. And the humiliation to go to the bathroom with the guards standing guard above us. My sister said, if they want to kill us, let them kill us. So she said, she, she just said, I don't want to live with such humiliation. While we were, in the, uh, were away and she was sitting, some German soldiers came to the camp and anyone they found they put on the list. So they put my sister on the list. The assumption was beyond any shadow of a doubt that that meant that um, she's going to go, uh, she, that she was on the list to go uh, to the guest chamber. So the only logical thing to do was for my mother and me to trade places with other two women who were on the list. And so... Uh, so to go to the guest chamber So that her. we go to the guest chamber alone. These two other women traded places with the hope to see another sunrise. Well, the following morning when they were calling out the names, and they called out my sister's name and these two uh, names of these two uh, people that we, my mother and I, took uh, their names. And so we reported they put us on a train and we were sent to Skarżysko. Uh, which was a, a slave labor camp. There is a slight difference between extermination camp and slave labor camp. Uh, an extermination camp was a factory, a modern, humongous 
factory of killing people. A slave labor camp uh, is where, was a place where you worked practically to death. And uh, Skarżysko and then later Częstochowa, uh, we worked in an ammunition factory and the Still, still I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you yes. to tell, uh, there, there's, so, there's so many things that we, we don't have time for you to tell, but yeah. the fact that your, your, you and your mother got on the list thinking you were going to go to your death and that ended up saving your life there. Yeah. Shortly after, on your way to Skarsisko on the train, the train stopped and again, your life was, your lives were saved there. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, you know, survival was mostly random luck. 99% uh, was random luck and maybe a half a percent was feistiness. But without the half a percent of feistiness, you were 100% dead. But my sis when we were on the train, there was one pit stop. And so uh, my sister had to go to the bathroom. And we pleaded with her not to go. And she said, but I have to. So my, my, we, we, weren't, we, weren't, we were like one, like one organism. We would not, we, wherever we went, we went together so that if we lived together or died together. And so my mother and sister, my, I and my mother followed my sister. Then the guns started uh, to uh, pop and they chased us onto the train. And uh, instead of going into the same train that we were, we boarded another by, wagon, by another wagon. We were just running from the bullets right. flying around us. And the fortunate thing was that that, that train, uh, or that wagon, uh, was unloaded, and there were three, in Skarżysko, there were three, um, three branches of uh, ammunition factory, and one branch was where they were working on um, gunpowder without any masks, without, uh, and for a whole day, and the people just turned within a couple of months absolutely yellow, the color of the of the gunpowder and the lungs, uh, and they just suffocated to death. So uh, that coincidence saved uh, our lives. It, it, it's such an understatement from reading your book and having the opportunity to listen to you on a couple of occasions that your mother was just a remarkable, remarkable woman. Um, tell us about the incident at Skarzysko where your mother confronted a really brutal guard Oh. You know, if you don't mind. Uh, yes. Well, we the, we we hardly ever saw a, a, a daylight. You know, there in this museum there is uh, um, the dome, the uh, glass dome, and uh, and. Um, it, it, it's interesting that the architect, the reason why he uh, made the glass dome was because when he interviewed um, um, survivors, they were so aware of the sky, and which re uh, reminds me, I'm sorry for digressing, but uh, we were so, uh, we marched every day of course, to work and back to the uh, to, to our barracks, and the one thing while we were marching that I was aware of was the patch of sky, and so once we were marching like this, one uh, um, one couple um, uh, started to beat uh, another uh, one of our uh, one of the people one of the. Um, uh, the um, Jewish people, and and uh, and they, of course there were always dogs. I'm to this day afraid of dogs, and uh, my mother stood up and a little woman stepped in front, stepped out of uh, of the marching um, uh, uh, of, of the slave labor people, and uh, and she said. 
my, the blood in, 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 in my grave will follow you for what you're doing to our people. And so my sister and I were so afraid that this would, they'll shoot us on the spot, but they didn't. It, I think it was at Scar Cisco that, that you and your sister and mother were referred to as the three monkeys, which, yes. which was the original title of your book, and it was yes. an affectionate term. Yes. But why did they call you that? We, we were so, we, we were so close, and so uh, we, we didn't take the, the, the instant for granted that we had one another. And of course, we were all covered with lice and mange, and, and the lice itched and you scratched, and, 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 you, and you, there was no medicine and, and just scabs oozing. And so we would just sit close together and pick lice. And they called you like the monkeys. Mm -hmm. So our, our um, friends, uh, the people would call us the three monkeys in an affectionate way. In the summer of 1944, you were forced to move again, taken by train to yet another camp called Shustehova. Yeah, but, yeah. And, and from, that's where you would eventually be liberated from. Right. Tell us about a little bit about Chustahova and then your liberation. Well, Chustahova was essentially like Skarzysko, it was also an ammunition factory. Mm -hmm. And we were so isolated. It was impossible to, we might as well have been on a different planet. It was impossible to imagine that only a few rabbit hops away from us, People were sailing on silver lakes, and children were sitting around tables and having meals as children should. We had no idea if the Allies were winning or losing. And here we, one night, we lying on our bare banks and uh, 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 planks, and we hear a rumble of planes. And we say, could it be? After all these years, now don't forget this was from September 1939 to January 1945. And we say, and then bombs start dropping. And it was like manna from heaven. To die by an allied bomb would be such a dignified death. We kept on saying, don't stop pleading to God, God, don't let them stop bombing. Well, we were liberated uh, the following day. In my book, I describe what liberation was like. I assure you, it was not at all like anything you are likely to imagine. Very little has been uh, written about, uh, about liberation. Uh, we, the, 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 the gate was, it was January, Poland is cold. And, and that was uh, an especially awful winter. 1945, it was very cold, and we, all we wore was caftans, and no underwear, no stockings, no sweaters, um, just um, uh, wooden clogs, and we, uh, and so I describe how the gate opened, how we shuffled out, how we uh, saw the Russian soldiers, how we ran up to them saying, oh, like Messiah was here. And they put up their hand and they said, sorry, we have a war to fight. And indeed they had, it was, uh, the war didn't end till May of that year. They gave us a slab of bread and they said, uh, be sure that you find shelter before, uh, before uh, nightfall was curfew, it was still uh, war. Um, and so we shuffled through it, 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 it starving. Uh, my uh, first, our first meal was um, some other people from the camp that met us told us that down the street there was a pickle factory and there were windows broken, so we climbed through the windows and my, our first meal was a dill pickle. Uh, and I was very grateful for it. We dug potatoes from the frozen ground, must have eaten them raw. Amazing how much human beings can endure and remain human and remain compassionate. 
and, uh, and, uh, and suffering does not have to drive you to despair and hate. It can teach you to love more deeply. And we're almost out of time, and of course... And I want to give some... I w I'd like to give some time to questions. I think we're going to have time for one or two, unfortunately, Good. but there's so much more that I wish Estelle could share with us, and uh, I, next time maybe we'll schedule her for four hours. And you can be. <laughs> but we, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Um, if you could go to the mic if you have a question. Um, we ask that you make your question as brief as you can. I'll repeat it to be sure everybody hears it, uh, and then Estelle will respond to your question. Um, if not, I will and ask you. And if a I, the questions that I'll miss uh, answering, you can read in my book. I'll be signing. Yes, you will. Later. Absolutely. And, and Estelle's going to close our program in a few minutes. It's our tradition that our first person has the last word, so I'll turn to Estelle to close it. Once she's finished, um, two things, uh, as our per first person with a question is coming to the microphone, two things, when Estelle's done, our photographer Miriam is going to come up on the stage and take a photograph of um, Estelle with you as the background. So I'm going to ask you all to stand so that we can do that. And then we're going to try to get Estelle off the stage and up there quickly so that she can sign copies of Transcending Darkness uh, when we're done. Um, so let's go ahead. We have two people brave enough to ask questions right here. And over you. Hi, Estelle. Thank you for being here today and presenting us with this story. First of all, my question that I've had for a long time is, what did you think of when you were first denied, first told that Jewish children weren't allowed to be played with, they couldn't go to school, you know, you couldn't shop in other stores and other people couldn't shop in the Jewish stores. What did you think of the Jewish people at that time? Or the German people, I'm sorry. The question is, what did you think of the Germans when you were being told of all the things that you couldn't do as a child? It, it, um, I, I, it was very, I, I, I was, I was, what was I thinking? I, it was incredible. I was thinking, I had this impulse to walk up to a soldier and to the soldiers and say, don't you have a mother and a father and children? How can you do it? Uh, and some part in me, some part in me believed that there was, that there was, that there was humanity in their hearts. And I still have to believe that it must be somewhere it must have been. Uh, it, it was incredible. I, uh, it, 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 for, it, I could not understand. If you cannot trust adults, these were adults, I was a child. If a child cannot trust adults, whom can you trust? It was very frightening. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we have a young man here with a question. Yes, I have a question. When you were liberated, who were you liberated by? The Americans or the Russians? Oh, were you liberated by the Americans or the Russians? I was liberated by the Russian forces. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank for you. your question. Thank you. And I think we have one more here. Thank you so much, Estelle, for sharing your story today. Um, curious whether or not your family was a religious family before the uprising. And um, how did faith play a part in your experience, okay. during the experience, and since then? Okay. The question was, was your family a religious family, and how much, how much role did faith play in your life during that time? My family was not a religious family. I'm not a religious person, but I consider myself a very spiritual person. I feel connected with everything and with ev that, that is living. I feel very much part I, 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 of everything that is living. And my family was very humanistic very, very concerned about kindness, about charity, about, about human dignity. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to turn to Estelle to close our program. I think 
Um, where, where we left off, unfortunately, um, with so much more to tell us, was with liberation in, in early 1945. The war would continue a time of chaos, and yet Estelle and her sister and mother went through unbelievable things after that, um, um, only to finally, two years later, more than two years later, make it to the United States in 1947. Estelle. I want to thank you all very much for being in the museum here and for listening. Seldom are people willing to listen or speak of such experiences because it generates such pain. Yet we have to be reminded from time to time what can happen to us and to civilization when we uh, accommodate ourselves to tyranny what it does to the conscience of a nation, what it does to love, and what it does to trust. Uh, your being here gives me faith. Uh, my mother in front of the crematorium said the world has a conscience. You will see if we'll survive that the German children will be asking their parents how could it have happened? Where was your conscience? And you know she was right. Uh, German people are now asking, how could it have happened in such a, in our country? And I feel that we are all left with the legacy to understand that human beings are capable of cruelties and to understand the importance of love the importance of human dignity, everyone's dignity. And thank you again so very much. <laughs>